the guys before we get too far into this i wanted to say sorry i didn't realize that my camera was focusing in and out so much because uh, i was using a webcam so bear with me i apologize that the the camera work isn't uh, super great so hopefully you guys can tolerate it hopefully you can learn something out of this presentation if not let me know and I'll try and redo it thanks guys All right, guys, so the uh, 2016 ERG is allowed as part of your state testing. And so you're able to actually utilize uh, the 2016 ERG. So as you open it up, first thing that you'll notice is on the inside cover, there is the shipping documents information. And so it's important that you remember uh, the names of each one of these documents. Unfortunately, I don't have a good cheat on how you can uh, utilize the ERG to remember those, uh, but there will be state questions that ask you specifically uh, things like uh, a bill of laden is for what type of mode of transportation, which would obviously be highway or road. Uh, a consist or a way bill is used in rail. An air bill is obviously used in aviation. And then there's a dangerous cargo manifest that's used for marine. And so make sure you find those sections in your book uh, that talk about the paperwork and take a look at them. It's important that you understand what a uh, shipping document looks like. And so they give you an example there of what a shipping document looks like. Uh, and then you'll notice at the very bottom it shows you a couple different placards. What they're trying to show you here is that a placard that has a four-digit UN number in the middle of it or has the orange with black lettering uh, uh, panel beside a placard that those placards are actually indicating that the material that's being shipped is in bulk and so we'll look at some other placards later on but when you see this that means that it's in bulk as you turn the page it gives you uh, something new to 2016 is they actually gave you an organizational chart or a, a uh, flow chart uh, for how to respond and how to utilize the book. I wouldn't get hung up too much on that. Uh, <clears throat> for safety precautions, one of the things that the ERG does is actually gives you a, uh, a list of actions. So if you're on scene and you don't have a clue of what you need to be doing, uh, you can always go back to uh, this page, page four of the ERG. I don't know why they put it on page four seems like something that you put even closer to the front of the book but uh, that's what they gave us is on page four and so if you read at the very top it says safety precautions and it says resist rushing in approach cautiously from upwind uphill and upstream stay clear of vapors smoke and spills keep the ve uh, vehicles at safe distances Isolate the area and protect yourself and others, and then it starts working down a flow chart of, of things that you need to do to help identify this. Uh, these questions probably won't be, or there probably won't be questions on the state tests that come out of this area, but just as a responder, it's important to know if you go to page four, it's going to give you quite a bit of useful information. And so uh, that's page four. If you turn your ERG to page six, you'll notice here's the hazard classes. And so, for example, Class 1 is explosives. Division 1.1 1 .1 are explosives which have a mass explosion hazard. Uh, when we get everything loaded into Google Classroom, there should be a military markings uh, page or a document in there that you can work through. Uh, there are questions, at least on the versions that I've heard students talk about, uh, versions of state tests that have been out lately, uh, there are questions around military markings. And so if you look at the explosives page uh, in your book, in the second edition of the Jones and Bartlett Awareness and Ops uh, Student Manual, when you get to the section that talks about military markings, if you look, there's similarities between the markings of uh, the U.S. military and DOT. So if you look at Division 1.1 explosives, which have a mass explosion hazards, well, if you look at the military marking one for uh, their markings for explosive, explosives, <clears throat> you'll see that it talks about mass explosion hazards. And so they actually line up similarly. So if you get that, that uh, symbol that has a one in it, you'll be able to identify that that is a mass explosion hazard. And so take a look at that uh, in your student manual 
to identify uh, the explosion hazards. So you can use this uh, segregation or this uh, classification hazard classification chart here to help you with the DOD military markings for explosives. Gases are class two, and you have flammable, non-flammable, uh, and toxic. Class three is flammable combustible liquids. Class four is flammable solids. And then there's different divisions under it. Class five is oxidizing substances and organic peroxides. Class six is toxics. Class seven is radioactive material. Class eight is corrosive substances. And class nine is miscellaneous dangerous goods. So, so class nine is classes one through eight. Uh, has hazards like one through eight, but they're not as strong or as hazardous as those actual hazard classes And so that's what gets put into class nine That's important to remember that the word poison or poisonous are synonymous with the word toxic when you talk about DOT Turn the page in your ERG to page eight and nine and what you have here is the placarding lookup table and so if you go in here You'll be able to identify different styles of placards. This isn't every placard that you'll ever see, but it's different styles of placards for each of the hazard classes. And so if you arrive on scene and all you can see is the placard and it has this placard here, which is class two, as you can see at the bottom, it has the number two. So class two, flammable gas. Uh, what this is telling you is go to guide 118, that circle with the number in it. Uh, is telling you what guide to go to. So the guides in the ERG are the orange sections. So if we turn to guide 118, it says flammable uh, gases, flammable corro uh, and corrosive is guide 118. So you can turn there to guide 118 and, and, and see that. So that's what page eight and nine are for, is just to look up what the material is based on the placarding that's on the side of the container. And you can see that there's multiple ones that are here. Turn the page again, and now you're on page 10 and 11. This is the uh, rail car identification chart. And so similar to the placards, this one is actually looking at the silhouettes of rail cars. And so it's important to pay attention to the pressurized tank car and the general service tank car or low pressure. You'll see these two possibly on the state test. It's hard to tell uh, from these silhouettes, but one of the only ways you're going to be able to tell if it's a pressurized rail car versus a general service or a low pressure rail car is one, the general service tank cars will have a bottom discharge, which is impossible to see on this silhouette. And two, if you look at the very top of the rail car on the general service, you can see there's multiple things sticking up on top of that rail car. That's what this is showing here. If you look at the pressurized rail car, everything in the pressurized rail car is contained within one housing. And so uh, all the valves, all the, the pressure relief valve, everything is contained within one housing on a pressurized tank car and there's no bottom outlets. And that's the only, only real good way you're gonna be able to tell the difference between a pressurized rail car and a general service rail car. Then there's other rail cars that are here. Something that we've been told uh, on the state test that there is a test question that asks about uh, what type of container a, a DOT 111A is. And if you look, I've highlighted here, uh, which I should note, the highlights in, the, in my ERG are for training aids so I can remember what to talk about. Uh, when you go into the state test, you're not going to be able to have a ERG that's marked up. If the CO discovers you have a marked up ERG, they're either going to kick you out or they're going to give you a new ERG. But if you look really, really close uh, on the side of the rail car on page 11, uh, you'll see in there it says DOT 111A. It's the third line down and it's super, super tiny. I don't know if that's coming through or not. Uh, that's the only place in the ERG that you're going to be able to know that a DOT 111A is a rail car. Now, there's no other way to look that up. So if you get that test question, it's best that you just remember a DOT 111A is a rail car. If you turn the page again to page 12, this is the highway or the road trailer identification chart. And so you can see there's an MC331, MC338, DOT 406, uh, DOT 407, DOT 412, and then you have tube trailers, you have dry bulk, and then you have uh, intermodal tanks as well. 
So when you look at, for example, the MC331, it's important to understand what the pressure rating is for these. And so if you look, the ERG says 100 to 500 PSI. These types of containers are very round. This is your propane delivery trucks that you have running around Kodiak. Uh, if you look at uh, photos of these, or if you go look at those tanks, the manways are going to be on the ends, sometimes slightly higher than middle range, and they're going to have a ton of bolts going through the manway uh, because it's holding back a lot of pressure. And these things, once again, are holding uh, LPG, liquefied petroleum gas, ammonia, those types of things. Uh, the next one, the MC338, this is your cryogenic, your refrigerated uh, trailers. Uh, these are big thermos bottles. So it has a skin, then insulation, and then the actual tank itself is on the inside of all of that. And so they look very big and bulky, but it's because they have so much in insulation. Uh, the maximum working pressure for these in your ERG says 25 to 500. I would find these working pressures in your student manual because that's where the state... Uh, test questions come from uh, so I would look them up in your state test questions DOT 406 remember the DOT 406 has that rollover protection that goes down the center uh, the top of the uh, highway cargo tank that's one of the only ways you're gonna be able to identify it. it has that that double line right there that's a DOT 406 it's also oval in shape and you can see that from uh, behind the DOT 407 these are the chemical haulers uh, these things are designed a little bit differently than the DOT 406. They usually have only one or two manways, and they do not have the rollover protection down the whole length. They're rounded. Sometimes you'll hear them called horseshoe shaped. Uh, and so you can see that sometimes there will be a horseshoe shape there, but sometimes they're also very rounded. The DOT 412, this is your corrosive or your acid tankers. Uh, these things have a lot of stiffening rings, which the DOT 407 can as well. Uh, but usually they're insulated. But the DOT-412 has a lot of stiffening rings. That's because the product in the DOT-412 is very, very dense. You can have uh, acids and corrosives that are 12 pounds per gallon up to 18 pounds per gallon versus water, which is 8.34 pounds per gallon. And so these are very, very uh, strong containers. The diameter of these containers is small compared to, uh, for example, the 407 or the 406. The diameter of the 412 is a lot smaller. Uh, tube gas trailers, if you get a question that asks about tube gas trailers, uh, it's going to be something like, what state of matter is in one of these containers? It's a gas. You are not going to have a liquid in a tube trailer. Uh, these things have high pressure. Uh, I think your book says 2,000 to 5,000 PSI. High pressure gas. Uh, so if you notice, just like in the placard lookup, the rail car and the highway cargo tank lookups have those black circles with the numbers in them again. Once again, that is telling you the guide number to go to, the orange section to go to. And so if all you have is the container shape to go off of, that tells you to go to that guide. Turn the page again, and this gives you the, the GIS, Global Harmonization uh, Information. So this is those uh, HASCOM labels that we put on drums or packages. This has nothing to do with DOT, but DOT realized that there was a benefit to adding this into the emergency responder because the packaging inside some of the containers could have this labeling on it. And so this is the, the uh, global harmonization standard that OSHA adopted uh, for employee warning. So your materials in your station, your chemicals in your station should have pictograms uh, and other information, as you see on this page, on page 14, uh, that describe what that the hazards of that chemical are. If it's got a red border, it's a, it's a GIS pictogram. If you look at these borders of the actual placards and labels, you'll see for the most part they have a black border. And so uh, keep that in mind as you're working through this. If you have questions about pipelines, uh, page 20 and 21 talk about pipelines. Remember that markers warn that a transmission pipeline is located in the area. They identify the product transported in the line and provide the name and telephone number of the pipeline operator to call, as you can see listed here. Now we get into the yellow section. The yellow section is a lookup by number. And so the ID number, the UNID number is looked up here. 
on both the yellow and the blue section, you'll see on the first page of that section, it talks about what the green borders are. If the material is green, highlighted green and it's not on fire, it's telling you to go to the green section of the ERG. If the material is not highlighted green, or if it is on fire, then you want to go to the orange section of the ERG. And all of that is said here on page 26 of the yellow section. If you go to the blue section, once again, the first, first page in the blue section says the same thing about highlighted green versus non-highlighted -highl green. This is done by alphabetical. So if we look up diesel fuel, if you turn to uh, the page for diesel fuel, you'll see that it is not highlighted green and it gives you a number uh, for the guide number. It says guide 128 and this is on page 113 of the blue section. Uh, so diesel fuel guide 128. So now what we wanna do is go to that guide. So guide 128 in the orange section is gonna be on page 194, 195. And you'll see at the very top, this is where you first want to look, it says flammable liquid, water miscible, which means it does not mix with water. The next place you want to go is down to the second bullet point under public safety, which says, as an immediate precautionary measure, isolate, spill, or leak area for at least 50 meters, 150 feet in all directions. After that, then we want to go down to the evacuation section, which says for a large spill, which is anything greater than 55 gallons, Consider initial downward evacuation for at least 1,000 feet. If it's on fire and it's a tank, rail car, or tank truck, uh, then you want to go a half mile in all directions and also consider another half mile uh, in all directions uh, for the initial evacuation. Uh, then the, obviously there's additional information that's on both sides of this, of this guide, but that's the orange section. Hopefully this is all refresher to you guys. The next section we want to go to is uh, the isolation distance in the green section, uh, we want to look up the initial isolation distance for those highlighted green materials. And so the first one is table one, which starts on page 296, and it lists out the material. So for example, the first one is ID number 1005, it's guide 125, anhydrous ammonia. So we would come here to the green section if anhydrous ammonia, which it is, highlighted green and it's not on fire. So it tells you for a small spill from a small package or small leak from a large package, you know, we want to first isolate in all directions 100 feet. Then protect downwind uh, for a day at, at 0.1 mile uh, and at night 0.1 mile. For a large spill, you'll see it says refer to table 3. So we keep going back in the table. And what DOT said was, hey, for those materials that are uh, the six most common toxic or poison by inhalation materials, we actually gave you additional information. So table three, which is on page 355, actually talks in more detail about uh, how far to evacuate and uh, isolate the area. So the other section in the green is the water reactive uh, materials that produce toxic gas. So if you look up sodium cyanide, in the blue section, sodium cyanide on page, if I can spell, sodium cyanide on page 194, you'll see it's highlighted green. So we're going to have a spill of sodium cyanide and it's not on fire. So therefore we go to the ERG, uh, I'm sorry, the green section of the ERG and we find sodium cyanide, which is on page 302. You'll see that sodium cyanide says, uh, 1689, guide 157, which we don't care about yet because it's not on fire. It says native material, sodium cyanide when spilled in water. And it says sodium cyanide solid when spilled in water. That tells us that material is uh, reactive with water and it will put, uh, produce a uh, toxic inhalation hazard. And so that's when we go to table two. After we do our evacuation table and all that, we go to table two, which starts on page three, 345, 347 
uh, and we find sodium cyanide, which is at the bottom of the page, and it says HCN. If you look at the very bottom, HCN is hydrogen cyanide gas. And so when this material reacts with water, which, by the way, all fire departments carry and love to spray, uh, when, this, when this product mixes with water, it produces sodium cyanide gas. And so that's how you find the uh, materials that are uh, uh, water reactive. Behind the green section, there's just more white uh, papers that talk about how to use the ERG. It talks about toxic inhalation hazards, isolation and evacuation distances, uh, protective clothing, so uh, street clothing, structural firefighting, positive pressure self-containment apparatus, chemical protective clothing is listed there. Uh, it talks about fire control and water reactive materials, uh, vapor control, and then it gets into blevies. The boiling liquid expanding vapor and it talks about the blevies on page 369 there's actually a blevy chart and so it will give you a rough idea how far you need to evacuate for different size of material how big the fireball will be how soon uh, the fire uh, the blevy could occur which if you look is usually about the time fire departments are arriving between four and nine minutes depending upon the size of the, uh, the container then if you go in the next section it talks about criminal and terrorist uh, use of chemicals and it actually talks about indicators things to look for like lack of uh, insect life and this is on page 370 371 uh, unexplained odor unusual members of uh, dying and numbers of dying and sick people patterns blisters all kinds of different material or uh, indicators are there uh, Obviously, on page uh, 372, it talks about pr uh, protein response, minimize any exposure time, maximize distance uh, in the item that's likely to harm you, and then cover as protection and wear personal protective equipment as for your protection. What that's saying is time, distance, and shielding, which applies, we, use, we usually use that to uh, radioactive material, but it applies to all different types of materials. Time, distance, and then shielding, protection. Page 373, it talks about uh, decontamination measures, and it, it says flush, strip, flush. And that's what you want to do when you have an incident where you have people that are uh, contaminated. Hose them down. We're talking low pressure, not high pressure. Hose them down, get their external clothes off of them, and you're going to get over 80% of the material off of them by removing their clothes. And then flush them again, and then transport as needed. Uh, page 374 and 375 talk about improvised explosives, so you can read all about those there. Page 376 then gets into the glossary. This is going to be your best friend when you're testing. <clears throat> so, there will be questions around biological agents, blister agents, blood agents, choking agents. Uh, they're all going to be uh, questions that you see on the state test. And so if you get a question... Uh, on the state test, uh, you can come here and look in the glossary. So, for example, biological agents, it says, living organisms that cause disease, sickness, and mortality in humans. Anthrax and Ebola are examples of biological agents, and then gives you a guide. Blister agents. So, if you get a question that says, what type of agent is mustard H or nitrogen mustard HN, if you go to blister agents, it tells you mustard H distilled mustard. It also tells you that it causes, it causes blistering of the skin, exposure, exposure is through liquid and vapor contact, and so it gives you all kinds of different information plus the symptoms. Blood agents are listed there, so if you have a question like uh, what type of agent is hydrogen cyanide or H, uh, AC, that's a blood agent. Choking agents are also listed. If you just cannot remember what the cold zone is, it will tell you here. If you can't remember uh, what cryogenic liquid is, it will tell you here. Uh, and so the glossary is your friend. Flashpoint, uh, hot zone, large spill. Here's where you can go to look to see what the size of the spill is. A spill that involves quantities that are greater than 55 U.S. gallons for liquids or greater than 660 pounds for solid. If you have a question around LC50, lethal concentration 50, it talks about it here. Uh, the ERG won't talk about LD50. Because LD lethal dose is uh, is is used for injection or ingestion, DOT only talks about lethal concentration inhalation because those are the materials that they're worried about, and so that's why they only talk about LC fifty. You could apply lethal dose fifty in the same manner, but just remember that it's done through injection or ingestion. 
nerve agents on page 382. Oxidizers, uh, it talks about pH, protective clothing, A, B, C, D. This isn't your dress-up clothes uh, for the fire department. Level A is fully encapsulated. Uh, or SCBA plus totally encapsulated chemical resistant clothing, permeation resistant, and it tells you more down there. Talks about small spills on page 384, specific gravity, vapor density on 385, uh, warm zone. And so all of that information is available here and should be available on the day that you test. Uh, so get to know the glossary, read through the glossary, understand what's there and the information that's provided. And then the last thing are the numbers uh, to call uh, so for Mexico or uh, in the United States, we have Chemtrek, Chemtel, Infotrek, 3E Company, Military Shipments, and uh, National Poison Control. This is who we call if we need additional information. So that's the uh, that's the 2016 ERG as a refresher. Spend some time with it. Uh, maybe we'll give you guys some exercises that you actually have to draw uh, the evacuation distances because that can be part of the state test where you actually draw the initial isolation distance, which the initial isolation distance is the second bullet down. Let me get a good one. That's the second bullet down in uh, public safety. So the initial isolation distance for guide 158 is 75 feet in all directions. So that is that circle that they indicate here. So initial isolation distance in all directions. And then you have the downwind distance, which is uh, it's the downwind distance, and it's as wide as it is down, uh, long downwind, and that's where you get uh, your actual uh, information from for evacuating downwind. So spend some time in here. This is on page uh, 294 if you can't see it through the camera. Spend some time with it. Uh, we'll ask you some more questions maybe or, or help you out there. Uh, feel free to ask us questions at any time. Uh, all right, guys. Thanks.